Well, God's grace, his mercy, his peace are all yours through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray he opens our hearts and minds as we hear his word. That word for today is from Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17. And it goes like this. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So, faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. That's our text. Please be seated. So today's text from Romans 10 serves us very well as we continue our sermon series called Spiritually Vibrant Households. We've talked about applying spiritual disciplines in our lives. We talked about extending hospitality into the world, and now we're entering into part three. It's really the reason for parts one and two, and that is engaging in spiritual conversations. And we're going to be focusing on the understanding of unity today. I recently had an experience of unexpected unity in the state of Texas, gathering with all these different families from around the country and even some other countries as well at Texas Christian University to celebrate the entrance of my son into studies there. People from all over the place. We had little in common except that our children were attending school together, but we all gathered and found strength and unity around this hand signal. So I want you to make the peace sign. All right, so put the both hands, peace sign, and now crook your fingers like that. There you go. You are all now honorary TCU horn toads. Congratulations. Do you feel the unity? This, it's, it's an interesting thing that's uh, throughout the conference in which TCU participates. They all have hand signals, but it's, a, it's an amazing moment of unity when everyone in this large room is making that same hand signal and we're all drawn together by the mystique and the history and the beautiful campus of Texas Christian University. There was real unity there. We found a different and closer connection with the people around us after we did the horn toad hand signal. It was quite remarkable. And unity, of course, in the gospel, much more important and also a major theme in the book of Romans. A quick walkthrough. Uh, unity with God through faith. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Unity with the very work of Jesus Christ. Romans 6, we're told that we're baptized into the death of Jesus and therefore also into his resurrection. Unity with the kingdom of heaven. Romans 8, 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And even unity between nations. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Unity, absolute unity, eternal unity. And this precious unity comes through the glorious power of the gospel. We just heard that in our text in verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So TCU students and alumni and parents, we rally around the horn frog hand signal. Christians. Followers of Jesus have a sign as well. We rally around that sign, that glorious symbol, the cross of Jesus Christ. We gather around that cross. We draw strength and comfort and assurance from that cross. Because more than anywhere else, it is on that cross that Jesus showed his great mercy, showed his overwhelming love, showed his desire for all of us to live in unity. The cross shouts out the words of John 3.16, those words that Jesus himself first proclaimed to the Pharisee Nicodemus and to us as well. So let's, in unity, say these words together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. This is a verse so common that often we say it without thinking. Often the the gravity, the weight, the importance escapes us. But think about it. There are no sweeter words. There are no more unifying words than the promise of our salvation through Jesus Christ. And so as we gather together in unity today to worship as we are nurtured through time spent in God's word and prayer, we then, by God's Spirit's power, turn outward to the world around us. And still in joyful unity and the power with which that Holy Spirit fills us, we approach the world as Jesus did, with open arms and joyful service, inviting others to share in the unity of the gospel. That's what we are about. Look, look around you here today. And I, I have to admit, I, I walk in here throughout the week and, and never get used to how many bricks make up this building, how much time and work it took to create this space, one brick at a time. And it's nothing compared to the Apostle Peter's analogy of a spiritual house made with living stones, made with us, with all those who follow Christ, with him as the foundation, with him as the cornerstone. He writes in 1 Peter chapter 2 that we are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And just like the purpose of this building is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, so the purpose of the spiritual house of God, which is us, is the exact same thing, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, to, to invite others into his gospel unity. And so in that framework, in that understanding, Paul, in our text today, he asks four questions that point out how God does this. And here are those questions from verses 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? How are they to preach unless they are sent? This is Paul as a courtroom attorney, which he does so well and so frequently, asking questions that he already knows the answers to that lead us to that inevitable, irrefutable conclusion. Each one of us is sent to share that unifying gospel with those who have not heard, so that they too, by God's Spirit, believe in him and call on him in trust for their salvation. What a glorious moment that is to watch someone gain that gift of faith and trust in Christ. So the remainder of our sermon series is about spiritual conversations. We're going to talk about God's noble and glorious calling for each of his children to share our faith. We've seen that calling clearly in Scripture today, and today we'll now add to it the latest research on these types of conversation in a world that has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. Some of you are old enough to remember that when you wanted to talk to someone, you talked to them. Or you called them on the phone. Or you used a phone, actually, to talk to someone, right? But now, add to all that instant messaging and texting and social media and post-pandemic, post-Christian culture. All the ways our interactions have changed because of all these things and so many others as well. So this is research conducted by Lutheran Hour Ministries, LHM, and Barna Group over the last few years, and they call this study Spiritual Conversations in a Digital Age. And these two organizations together wanted to understand first the current state of the church by asking two questions. How many spiritual conversations did Christians have in the last year? And how many understand that having such conversations is part of being a Christian. And they set the bar pretty low. They defined a spiritual conversation as any conversation about faith or about the lack of faith. That's a pretty low bar, right? And yet, 
these are the results, 75% of, of Christians surveyed had fewer than nine conversations in the last year, and 9% had zero spiritual conversations in the last year. So that's 84% of Christians who had less than one conversation about faith or the lack of faith each month. And then Barna and LHM also wanted to compare findings between today's research and research from 1993 that they conducted regarding the church's attitude towards evangelism and also how the church trains and sends its people out to share the good news. And these are the results here. In 1993, 89% of all Christians found, felt that the church, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead, 89% of all Christians believe that sharing their faith was part of being a Christian, and today that number is 64%. And then in 1993, 77% of Christians felt the church had equipped them to share their faith. Today that number has fallen to 57%. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have work to do. That's why we're, we've undertaken this, this sermon series. We're, we're called by God to speak the love and truth of Christ into the ears of the people that he has put into our lives. So let us resolve together, relying on the Holy Spirit's power to become stronger in his word, to become committed to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it can be as simple and as powerful as what happened with Ben Lyons, who's here today, who turned nine four days ago, right? Happy birthday, Ben. Ben plays baseball, and most of the kids on his team are not from our shepherd. They're public school kids. He's the only kid from our shepherd, right, Ben? And Ben wanted to do something to live out his faith, and so he decided to wear those crosses under his eyes with eye black and also to cross himself and pray before each game. He, he didn't put any pressure on any of his other players, his friends, to do the same thing. He very simply and quietly wore those crosses on his face. And then another player did. And then another. And another. Pretty soon there were a few kids who were wearing crosses on their faces for each game as well. And one in particular we're going to call him Jake, his friend Jake, a neighbor, a close friend. They play catch together. They carpool together to games and practices. Jake seemed a little bit more engaged than the others, and he actually approached Joe, Ben's father, and asked him, can, can I give Ben a sliding glove for his birthday that has a cross on it and maybe some scripture too? And if you can see the symbols underneath the cross, it's a, an interesting group of symbols. It simply means God is greater than our highs and our lows. Well, Joe, of course, was thrilled, and he said yes. And Ben received that gift, and he was thrilled, and he wears it all the time. Ben, do you wear it to bed also? Yes. <laughs> if you were allowed to, I'm sure you would. It's a wonderful gift, and Ben loves it as well. But even better, even better, Jake's father began having conversations with Ben's father asking things about spiritual life. Why? Because Jake was asking questions about God, questions that his father couldn't answer, questions that he needed help with. And so from that simple gesture of Ben's, of wearing those crosses on his face, now comes deep spiritual conversations through which God, by his Spirit's power, plants seeds that we pray grow into a thriving, saving faith in Jake's family, and who knows? Who knows where that flame spreads from beyond there? Ben, we're thankful God used you in that way. And what Ben did, very simply, very naturally, was live life together with his friends as they played baseball, and he also did an important thing. He lived out his faith in a way that just put no pressure at all on the people around him. He simply displayed the cross of Christ. He simply crossed himself and prayed before each game. He made no demands on his fellow players. And in doing so, he attracted those around him who wore crosses on their faces, and he created curiosity, which brought questions. Ben was living in the first part of the curve. What is the curve? Well, some of you received this 
curve card when he came in. And here's what it looks like for those who don't have one in your hands. This weekend's takeaway, and actually something one will reference throughout the series, is called the LHM Curve Card. It's this big. It's small, so you can fit it in your purse or your pocket. And it gives suggestions on how to approach people who are in one of what they call three spiritual postures towards the gospel. Unreceptive, receptive, and seeking. Now, Ben didn't do that assessment. He just simply lived his faith in a way that was consistent with that first part of the curve, which is intended to be towards people who may be unreceptive toward the faith. Clearly, some of his teammates were receptive, and at least one, Jake, I believe was seeking. He started asking more questions. He wanted answers. So please take one or more of these curve cards home. They're designed to be for one specific individual in your life whom you identify through prayer as someone who needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so on the back of the card are three different sections that you fill out to help you understand where that person might be on their walk, on the curve, and how you might approach them and how you might pray for them as well. Each week, we're also going to have a call to action as a way to help move us all forward in sharing the gospel in word and in deed and in truth. And so this week's action is this. First, an introspective one. In your minds and hearts, get honest with the state of your own witnessing. How many spiritual conversations have you had in the last week, in the last month, in the last year? And after you've made that assessment, say a prayer as you seek to identify that one person whom you will engage with the gospel of Jesus Christ and then fill out the curve card with that person's information. And I've made my own assessment. I've tried to separate out my vocation as pastor from the rest of my life and understand how many spiritual conversations I've had away from church. And so, as best as I can say, a rough estimate, about 25 or so in a year, which is not even one per week. That's... It's not enough. So my new goal for myself is one, at least one conversation each week. And I fill out a curve card. I've identified a neighbor who I believe is in that receptive area, the center of the curve, that I'm going to be more intentional about sharing the gospel with and by God's grace, moving her along to a place where she'll want to come to church on a regular basis. And I pray, and I ask you to pray also that God helps you identify that person in your life who needs to hear about the gift of faith that you have, that faith which gives you strength for the day and bright hope for tomorrow. So in all of our spiritual conversations, we seek to bring others into God's unity of faith and therefore into his salvation, right? So that they too join us as we gather around the cross of Christ as we sing his eternal praises. Amen? Amen. Please rise. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we thank and praise you for the opportunity that you've given us, this glorious task of sharing the saving words of your gospel. Enlighten our minds and our hearts, dear Lord. Show us that person, those people. Help us to understand where they are. Help us to approach them. Give us the words, the phrases, the intonation. Lord, give us all that we need to share that glorious gospel. And by your grace, bring them into unity and fellowship and your eternity. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, let's confess that God-given faith now in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. 